Thank you all for coming in and thank you for filling out ITV News' survey. Uh, one of the big headline stats that's come out of it is that 81% of BAME MPs have experienced racism from the public. Uh, Leila, you're sitting closest to me. Mm -hmm. Is that something you've experienced during your time as an MP? Absolutely. Um, I'm shocked that it's 81% and not 100% actually, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, mainly for me, it's been on social media channels and by far and away, whenever I mention anything to do with my background or ethnicity, that comes back, you know, you immediately get that torrent of people who want to tear you down. Um, and the comments about sort of going home <laughs> come to me quite a lot. Uh, and it's really hurtful, it's horrible. And you learn, I think, to wear a, an armoured jacket so that you don't listen to it. And actually I've got as much right to be here as absolutely everyone else, and indeed, when I meet my people in my constituency who share that kind of international background, actually they appreciate the fact that you can look at things from different perspectives. So I see it as a good thing, but it is hurtful sometimes. Uh, now, as you were nodding along there, how does it make you feel when you're getting messages online or generally from members of the public? It, it's, a, it's the armoured jacket that you put on, literally, and you don't look at the comments, because if you look at the comments, it can be so depressing. Um, you know, I've had, I've had somebody who went to prison for 12 weeks for the kind of emails, threatening emails to myself, to my family, the racism, the Islamophobic nature, all of that. So yeah, and that was just over this last uh, summer. So it, it's, it's painful, especially when it involves your family and you, you have to take uh, precautions for your family's safety. I mean, I think our country is currently at a crossroads and we have to stand up to the growing abuse that we're all getting, especially in public life. Um, it's got progressively worse because of social media. The people feel that they can contact us directly. I mean, I think that we shouldn't be advocating, even though we do sort of put on an armour jacket, I don't think we should have advocated that. Mm -hmm. I don't think people should have a thick skin to come into politics. I think everybody else has to behave properly and with dignity and respect towards us. Uh, for the job and the role that we do. But the abuse is constant. I also had somebody that went to prison. Um, but the abuse is constant. Inside Parliament, outside Parliament. I'm standing for Deputy Leader, that makes it even worse. The abuse is just uh, something you live with, but you shouldn't have to. Julia, what about you? Is it something that's impacted your career as you've been serving as an MP? I've had lots of incidents of racism, but I think the time I remember it the most is when I took the decision to vote against triggering Article 50. I'm strongly Remain, a representative constituency that was 76% Remain, and I decided to vote against triggering Article 50. And the abuse I received wasn't just that I'm a traitor, it was that I was a coloured traitor. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just about me going against the will of the people. Oh, actually, you're going against the will of our people, like I was someone else, even though I was born in London. I went to school in my constituency and grew up there, and even then, it was all about, well, why don't you just go back home? And I was thinking, where? To Hampstead? Because that's my home. <laughs> so that was when there was a real backlash of, how dare you vote in this way, because you don't understand how we feel, you coloured person. Yeah. And that's when I really saw it. I mean, I've seen it before, but that really brought it home. Um, Afsa, what about you? When you're receiving these sort of messages online, do you feel as though you're not treated the same way as others? And do you? I think I feel the same as my other colleagues, what they've said. But at heart of it, what I find really disappointing is that instead of going forward, I feel Britain is going backward. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is painful, because you would expect certain behaviour, but you would think as things are moving forward, things will get better. What we've seen is, I think, particularly with the social media coming into our lives, and also I think that this whole Brexit thing, that a friend, starting from that, it's almost people feel there's a license now to challenge things, mm. and challenging people's right to be here, and those, I mean, myself, over 50 plus years I've been here. This is my country. Everything I have, everything I want to give back is to this country, but they still want to challenge you who you are. That's um, why I think we're at a crossroads, and I think post-Brexit we have to be so highly aware of what's going on and we have to raise our voices to stop it. The next question is not so much about members of the public but instead about what you've experienced whilst in Westminster. So our survey found that 62% of BAME MPs have experienced racism, racial profiling or prejudice whilst on the parliamentary estate and 51% said they've actually experienced it from their fellow MPs. Mm -hmm. um, does anyone have any particular examples they want to discuss or talk about? That's quite low. I'm quite surprised that it's only mm -hmm. that percentage. I thought it would have been 
higher. But um, but yeah, I mean, all the time I've publicly talked about being in the lift and being told this lift isn't for cleaners, trying to go to eat lunch with my team and being told that we're not allowed to go past this point because we're not a member of parliament, being escorted out of the tea room because you know, they think that I'm not a member of parliament. Mm -hmm. So this, I mean, this bias and this racial bias, I mean, flows through society, but, um, and so I was actually quite disappointed with myself to not expect it. So when it first happened to me, I was more upset with myself because I thought, no. why didn't I expect it? Because there's so few of us, and obviously I, I thought parliament would be different, but it wasn't. And it shocked me, to be honest, the first time. I happened. think it's right that we shouldn't expect it. Like, we should expect better of our parliament. The I fact know. that this has happened. But I, let I, my, I felt I let my guard down. I thought, why did you let your guard down? You're entering parliament that is very much designed for white men. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not designed for women. It's not designed but for black women. But we hope that those stereotypes are wrong, right? And, and these kinds yeah. of surveys and conversations show that it's everywhere. Yeah. And it needs exactly. challenging. Yeah. Yeah. Is that something that everyone else has experienced as well? Do you feel as though Parliament is designed to work against you? I, I haven't had those stories, but my God, when I heard them, I could believe them. Mm. <laughs> it didn't take a giant leap to see how that happened. And then we've seen examples recently of people getting mixed up because they're a black female, right? Mm. And so different pictures are being used of different people under the wrong names. It's just like, I can't believe that people allow this to happen. And I think it's just because, you know, that stereotype of the white, male, pale MP still exists. And, well, look at us, you know, mm. we're awesome mm. and don't look anything like that. Yeah, <laughs> I absolutely mm. agree. Parliament is not made for... Parliament isn't even made for the working class person, let alone mm. if you've got... if you're a female, let alone if you're of a different heritage, a different ethnicity. And then for me, I've got the added whammy of being a Muslim. You know, so it becomes you come into Parliament and you think, yes, you've, you've you know, battled your way here, you've broken the glass ceiling, you're actually here where it's going to be quality, you've ad advocated quality for the whole of the country and that's what we're supposed to be doing, but actually we're landing somewhere where we don't have that equality. We, you know, just if, even if you look at the last few weeks of the select committees, 20 select committees, not one main member of Parliament was selected to chair one select committee. Mm. That just speaks volumes. It's not as if we're not there. We are there and people are putting themselves forward. So why? And why not just that, that we're there, yeah. we're qualified yeah. and overqualified in most cases mm. because we've had to work twice as hard mm. to get to where we are because we've had to overcome so many additional barriers. So it's not just we're qualified, we're overqualified, but still underrepresented. Um, you've touched on the next topic there which was that 92% of the people that responded to the survey said that it was more difficult for them to become MPs because of their ethnicity or their faith. Um, there's often a phrase that's thrown around that people from ethnic minority backgrounds need to work twice as hard as their counterparts. Tulip, is that something that you found when you were trying to become an MP? I think the thing I found most interesting when I tried to become an MP is people's shock and horror when I said I wanted to stand for Hampstead and Kilburn. Bearing in mind, I did go to school there, I have lived there for years and years, and I'm involved in sort of my parents got married there in the 1970s. I, my roots couldn't be stronger in the constituency. When I said I wanted to go to Ham stand for Hampstead and Kilburn, which is my home seat, the reaction of people was like, oh no, you can't stand there, you should go stand in East London. I said, why? I've always lived here. Why would I go and stand in East London? Oh, because there's a big Jewish community who won't vote for you. I said, really? I grew up in the heart of the Jewish community. Don't underestimate the Jewish community. They'll vote for me because I'll work for them. They don't vote based on last names. Mm. And it was interesting because my predecessor was not Jewish, but she was a white woman. So that reaction of, oh, no, you couldn't possibly. Some people said to me, why don't you take on your husband's last name, which is an English name, because people won't want to vote for Tulip City. Well, guess what? They voted for Tulip City in Hampstead and Kilburn three times now. Um, Afsa, did you feel the same way? Did you feel as though you had to work harder to get your seat than you would have had to do? I think the, probably the full sentence says you have to work twice as hard and do half as long to come down. So that's the other side of the coin so, yeah. as well. So it's not just going up, mm -hmm. it's also coming down. And I feel, yeah, I mean, I've been, uh, when I was going through the processes, uh, when everything seems to be going fine, when you have a backing of all the trade union, and suddenly you're not put on the shortlist. When you've done an excellent interview as well, they say so, that you have nothing wrong with your interview, then you wonder, whoa, what has happened here? Uh, when you're going through the process and you suddenly find uh, that it's not a level playing field. Uh, again, it's difficult then.
Lola, you... Yeah, so um, my experience of it, having stood in a couple of seats before I ended up in, in Oxford, which is a very diverse community and, and genuinely I've had no problems there at all, but there's a sort of underlying current, particularly with some parts of the membership, that being from a different background could be a barrier to being elected. And actually, when you actually become selected, the electorate itself, people out there have less of a problem with it than sometimes the membership think they might have a problem with it. And actually that kind of undercurrent of, they'll never ask you, <laughs> they'll never talk to you about it, but it's a well-known thing that needs challenging. And actually the way I got a grant it was having advocates who would actually have those conversations with those people who thought it was a problem and say, well, actually, no, and to make the positive case mm -hmm. for actually having a different background means that you are very relatable to a lot of people who might not otherwise be attracted to your party, and that's a good thing. But it's definitely there, and it's often very quiet and under mm -hmm. the radar. I, f I feel like it would be amiss not to say a bit about what happened when I first got elected or was running for election, and journalists were very interested in my seat because my predecessor had only won it by 42 votes. And journalists constantly said to me, you know, when you get into Parliament, there'll be some issues that you'll want to champion and talk about. I assume Bangladesh is one of them. I said, no, I have a very small Bangladeshi community in Hampstead and Kilburn, barely, I think, 800 people. But I will be talking a lot about Israel-Palestine because that topic is very important to my constituents. European Union is very important to my constituents. Education is a passion of mine. I want to be in the shadow education team, or at the time, I thought maybe education team. Obviously, we didn't win at the time. But they were very surprised when I said, actually, I don't want to join the all-party parliamentary group on Bangladesh. I don't want to constantly talk about halal meat. I don't want to constantly talk about wearing the hijab because I'm not interested in those topics. So the fact that they think they can pigeonhole you, I think the media and journalists have to examine what they keep coming to you for every time they want a comment. I'd like to comment on defence as well, as actually. I'd like to comment on Trident. I'd like to comment on education spending and cuts to health services as much as the next person. Mm. Dawn, you're mm. running for deputy leader. Do you feel as though, of the Labour Party, does that, do you feel as though you've had to work a lot harder than those who are running against you? Yeah, 100%. And again, it's kind of, I've surprised myself that I didn't think that I would have to. Um, when you think about my experience that I came in in 2005, I've served under two Labour Prime Ministers, um, and yet still you have to keep constantly reminding people because they forget, they forget about your experience, the same thing in terms of having to work twice as hard to get somewhere and then it's just forgotten. So you're hyper visible when they want to remember something maybe you might have not done 100% right, but they will forget things that you've done that you've been really good at and we have to constantly remind people. And I think the fact that we don't have enough diversity around of people seeing that you can be a leader and be black and be a woman, you know, and you can still be a leader, that it doesn't have to be a white man who's a leader, is kind of shaking it all up a bit. And I also think that, you know, sometimes I feel I have to talk about issues around black women because there's not enough people talking about it. And so until we get to a stage where everybody's talking about it and we have allies talking about it on our behalf, you have to constantly remind people that we are in the room and we have a right to be in the room. Um, last question to everyone. You've all mentioned about feeling slightly pigeonholed and being asked about certain subjects and topics because of your ethnicity. What do you think needs to be done to address these issues? We've raised loads in our survey, but going forward, what would you all hope happens to change these things? I'll start. I, I think what needs to happen is each one taking responsibility uh, for the way the world we have and trying to make sure that there's more fairness and uh, trying to put yourself into somebody else's shoes and see how they may be feeling about this and trying to challenge some of the subconscious level stuff which goes on as well. Nice. I think, I think the whole of Parliament needs a real cultural shift. There's, for, right now, for me, in the last few years that I've been a Member of Parliament and the four of us came in together um, in 2015, the culture has shifted to a culture of pandering. And we've seen it in the last few weeks, we've seen it, and, and every time. So, so for me, I feel that that culture shift has to be stop trying to make us into there's this idea that where we've become victims we're actually survivors and we've survived to get to where we've got to and we've survived all of the kind of abuse and the narrative we, we refuse to be victims which is why we're here and we, refu we, we refuse to tolerate that narrative and we want change for our communities for a better britain and that includes everybody 
And it needs to be understood that racism is a cancer for all communities, not just black and minority ethnic communities. It's, a, it's an absolute cancer in all society. So it's not just my responsibility. I came in as the MP for Bradford West. I've become a Muslim MP, but actually a lot of my constituents are non-Muslim, not, not black. And what about those conversations? We, we, and it's like Julep said, we do get pigeonholed and that cultural shift has to start, but it has to start right at the top. And if it doesn't happen at the top, it just makes it that much harder for people like us and more conversations like this are needed to explore it and look at what's actually going on. Yeah, I mean, I agree. And I think that um, media outlets have to start making an effort because instead of just making assumptions, they need to start making an effort. So not being able to identify me as an African-Caribbean woman different from Marsha, De Cordova, or Florence, or Belle, you know, needs to stop, needs to change. We need more diversity in the boardroom, we need more diversity in media outlets. And I do think that even when this show is aired, we're all gonna get a lot more abuse. Mm. People are gonna say, how dare you say what you said? And we're just gonna get more and more abuse. Every time you raise an issue, every time you raise your head above the parapet, we get more abuse. But actually, if we don't front up to it, then it's never gonna stop. And we need more allies as well to help call it out. At the time at which I will think that equality is be being taken seriously in Parliament and politics is when it's not just us speaking about it. I mean, this is something that is bad for society, bad for democracy, bad for the country. So I, I agree with Don. We need allies. We need people who actually speak up when they think, OK, this doesn't look right. I had an article written about me, which the headline was in a major newspaper saying, where do her loyalties really lie? Where was all the backlash from my mm. white colleagues saying, this is unacceptable? Mm. I didn't see that. So I think it's about support coming from people who are not suffering it. It's the way I've tried to stand up and speak for my constituents who are facing anti-Semitism. So I'm the vice chair of the All Party Parliamentary Group Against Anti-Semitism, and in my constituency, it's very important that I stand up for the community, and I think the Jewish community will say in my constituency that locally I've tried to stand up for them. Well, I also expect my colleagues who don't support, that don't suffer from the Islamophobia that I get, the misogyny actually as well, the fact that uh, they see me often as being the other, I want people to speak up for me as well, and I think that's when Parliament will change and democracy will change. I'm in a situation now where if I go to a school and there's a lot of young ethnic minority women who say to me, what's politics like? Should I join? Actually, I'm caught between a rock and a hard place. Should I be honest with them and say, do you know what? It's actually quite horrible. I don't want to put them off. I want to encourage young women to stand. But I also feel a sense of responsibility because I think if I do encourage them to stand, Am I telling them to walk into the lion's cave and suffer a bit like we're suffering? And what I would say is, I have not suffered in the way Diane Abbott suffered. Mm -hmm. I mean, she has received the worst abuse of all of us out of any MP. So I think it's bad for me, but it's 10 times worse for someone like Diane, who's in a position of power and is a black woman. Uh, Ella, final thoughts? I think there will be people watching this who are thinking this is just tokenistic, tokenistic rubbish, right? And I genuinely believe they do not stand for the majority of people in our country who want a diverse Britain, not for any tokenistic reason, but because they appreciate what it brings to our society and that that's what we're built on. And to have MPs worried for their position because we are representing, actually that fundamental value is incredibly worrying. I totally agree with colleagues who are saying we are moving backwards and not forwards. And I would love to see not just us talking about it, but actually the whole of society calling this out and saying this is bad for everybody and not just the one or two people who have the position to be able to talk about it. This affects all communities, whatever the colour of their skin, whatever background they might come from. In a response to ITV News' investigation, a spokesperson for the House of Commons said it is unacceptable that some MPs have experienced racism and we are particularly concerned to hear of instances occurring on the parliamentary estate. We are committed to taking any necessary steps to ensure this does not happen in future.